Thank you. Hello, and welcome to Communicating Complexity in an Age of Noise. If you're looking to talk about knowledge, noise, media, audience, and trust today, you're in the right place. So again, my name is Sam Hines Garcia, and just two sentences about me before I intro the panelists. I direct communications and creative work for an independent nonprofit research institute in New York called Data and Society. So I work to convey the insights of experts who study the societal effects of emerging technology from deep fakes to data privacy. Um, I do need to force you to interact with me for a moment here. I want to take a quick poll by hand, if I may. Um, how many people in the audience consider themselves to be media makers? Show of hands. All right, welcome. And how many of you are from the worlds of research or education? Yeah. Awesome. It's so great. And if you're not from those groups, I hope you have insights to share with us during the Q&A. So Republica this year is all about TLDR, and when I heard that, I thought, we've got to do this. We're going to spend the next hour talking to three awesome women about how they make complex ideas into too real did read. Um, really quickly, from my vantage point, working with experts, I've learned that they actually really, even the most academic ones, have great instincts to share about evidence and care deeply that their knowledge gets out there in ways that are meaningful and resonant and digestible. Given the last two years of tech lash and disinformation globally, I think we all need to get smarter about how to convey high quality information and be better about feeding knowledge to our global debates on the unexpected consequences of networked information. So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce these three amazing thinkers who take meaningful ideas about today and the future and make them resonate. So joining me here, I have Lena Srivastava, who is founder and director of the Creative Impact and Experience Lab, uh, Anne Vizarek, who's a consultant, digital strategist, and author of the book, Weil ein Ausgrei nicht gleich für ein Feminismus von heute, or in English, Why an Outcry isn't enough for a feminism of today. And finally, Antonella Napolitano, Privacy Policy Officer at Privacy International. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to start with you, Lena. Uh, you've been leading some incredibly impressive documentary media campaigns, maybe the, the most impressive in recent memory, the Oscar-winning Born into Brothels, the Oscar-winning Innocente, uh, and the Sundance Award-winning migration epic Who is Diani Cristal, starring Yael Garcia Bernal. My question for you is, from your vantage point, how have you seen narrative-driven knowledge projects contribute to systemic change over time? Uh, so first of all, thank you for having us. This is really wonderful to be here at Republica. Uh, and thank you, Sam, for inviting us. Um, so when I think of systemic change, uh, I think about the people who are within the system, who are caught in the system, or who are benefiting from or being disadvantaged by the system. And the only way I can really understand the benefits, the costs, the opportunities of a system, whether it's a political system, a technology system, is by understanding the stories that people are telling, mm -hmm. right? What are they, how are they experiencing the system? How are they experiencing the political system? How are they experiencing the use of technology, how they're experiencing all of this. Most of the work that I do 
is in the realms of refugee and migrant rights, gender justice, climate change, and poverty alleviation. So all of those things have intense systems that are guiding the way people experience them. And the only way I can push on the systems as a strategist, as someone who does um, work in contextualizing what's happening in the system, I have to elicit story, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not using data. I'm not usually using fact. Mm -hmm. It is accurate, but it is interpreted, right, through the lens of what people are experiencing. And narrative drives that. So narrative mm -hmm. systems themselves are driving the way we um, contextualize, comprehend, and change systems. Mm -hmm. Maybe a, a follow-up on that sentiment. Um, on the traditional, more academic side, we sometimes overvalue institutional expertise at the expense of knowing our audience, um, and even knowing the distinction between stakeholders and audience members. So maybe for the whole group, but also for Lena speaking to you, um, how can advocates and educators work smarter to integrate the perspective of local communities and local stakeholders? Yeah, so I'll use an example of one of the projects that you talked about. So I'm the social impact director for a project called Who is Diane Cristal, which is about the US-Mexico border. And it's about the story, it's a documentary, it's like a standalone documentary that we created a social impact media and campaign around. And we use digital assets and we use direct service and direct dialogue with affected community members, who in this case are in Honduras. Um, and the, the movie itself is about one man from Honduras who dies on the, in the Arizona border over the U.S. side of the U.S.-Mexico border. And that narrative, his story, is the story of his death, of the quest to identify his remains and repatriate them to Honduras, to his family, and the journey that he takes, like the migration journey. We created an entire um, social impact campaign around that story. But the way we did it was going back to the community in Honduras, the community that he left. Like that was our starting point. And we, com we sort of constructed this entire campaign based on what they, the family and the community members, were telling us about why they're migrating, how they're migrating, um, the ages at which the younger and younger is falling, like how, how soon children are leaving, and then what happens when they try to get to the U.S. So we constructed, and it's a free resource, so I will, we will treat our resources out later. And anybody who works in migration is allowed to use what we put together. But we created um, sort of a system of stories that are coming from the community. And we did that by being in direct dialogue with them. Amazing. This brings me, I think, to Anne. So Anne, you know, this traditional conception of a public expert, you usually write a book and then you launch a campaign. But you are more efficient than that. Um, you established the hashtag Aufschrei, which I basically explained to my New Yorker friends as the German Me Too. Um, so I'm really curious, now that you have the perspective of time, it's been several years um, in your emergent leadership, what is the difference really between starting a social movement through a digital campaign back then versus how would it go now? And do you have any advice for the audience about how to use social media to convey new social or cultural ideas? Yeah, um, also thank you for me for inviting me to this panel. Um, the thing is, um, that when I look uh, back at Aufschrei, which was in 2013, which for some it doesn't seem that f uh, long ago, um, but compared to what we, uh, for example, see how, uh, f yeah, especially media coverage is happening around Me Too, it's much different, of course. I mean, not just because it's on an international scale, but also when I look back 2013, I still had to explain to journalists what a hashtag is. So that's definitely changed, um, which is good. And uh, it's, I'm also proud that I think the Aufschrei campaign um, in the German speaking sphere was also uh, um, doing its work there to educate um, media makers in that sense. So um, I think there's less work uh, to be done to actually explain why uh, a hashtag is uh, a good way of um, 
conveying these issues and making people uh, participate. But of course, in this case, it was an ad hoc campaign, so it wasn't a, a planned one, but it sort of was born out of the situation of feeling this urge and the need to share our own uh, stories. And that's totally what we've seen again, um, not just with Me Too, but with other hashtags before that. I mean, one very prominent one that I remember from the US was Yes All Women, mm -hmm. for example. So it's not the first one. It's always important to remember that. Um, but I think um, they're all kind of playing off each other, um, especially when they've been covered in the media uh, very prominently. So that's also important for us as activists to learn from that and see, okay, how have they been portrayed? Uh, what's being discussed? How are the issues actually being addressed because I think in the, um, at the moment right now we're at a point where of course it's still very important to share these very specific and personal experiences and have these personal stories and basically faces attached to what we know from the data already in this case regarding violence against women. Um, but I also think that especially as people who are starting um, campaigns or want to start one, um, we also have somewhat uh, a duty of, of care that comes with it. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, what I mean by that is that especially when, um, uh, yeah, when it's being discussed publicly and in the media, you know, you have all the talk shows, the big newspapers um, writing about these issues, it's very important that we're not just pushing stories out there to be consumed in the news cycle. We also have a duty of care uh, in regard to the people who shared these stories in the first place. And um, I have to admit, I don't have like the perfect answer here, um, but I definitely see that's, uh, that this is like the next level where we have to take it, to be aware of this issue in the first place, but also to figure out, especially as feminists, how to sort of create um, somewhat safer spaces versus the very public ones, um, uh, especially when it comes to yeah this uh, this capitalist notion of of just you know consuming uh, what's being put out there and treating everything as if it's something new instead of putting it into context. So, for example, I think a huge step forward was when the German media talked about Me Too here. Uh, they usually referenced Aufschrei, so it gave a, co a point of context for people who knew the discussion from back then and see okay okay, this is not something new, this is actually something we have been discussing before. And I think that is very important to not just, you know, uh, talk about the same thing uh, over and over again, because, of course, we want change, we want to get something done, so we need to get further in that way. Yeah, that really resonates with me. I think, um, you know, data and society, um, some of our work looks at bias being encoded into new technologies and to foreground that in the history, for example, of the U.S. civil rights movement is a really important context to have going in so that we're not just spinning up and spinning up new controversies, but we're looking back at a very long legacy of action that has occurred from our forebears and take that knowledge and wisdom forward. So Antonella, uh, Privacy International, amazing organization, advocates for strong privacy protections and surveillance safeguards in law and technology. And you have a really unique role in that you work not just on the research and the investigation side, but also advocacy and engagement. And, you know, I love reading Privacy International's work from an American perspective because you might think it's an easy value for a lot of people to understand, but I think ideas like consent and collective or networked privacy are really complex and they don't have the same cultural meaning everywhere. So my question for you, bouncing back on that, is what do you see as the biggest structural or cultural challenges to making people care about privacy in your work and what media tools can we be using to to sort of get them there uh, well uh, well first of all 
Thank you for, for having me, and it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor after many years of attending Republica to, uh, to be on stage. Um, uh, Privacy International, as you said, uh, um, does a number of, of activities in, in this space, challenging government and companies. And I think, um, especially after the um, whistleblower's revelation about surveillance, uh, there might be, especially in the Western world, this idea that surveillance is uh, something that, and it's something we encounter daily, it's not something that is related to me because it's, it's a lot of people, I'm not like, this, the false dichotomy of security versus privacy is definitely a challenge, uh, which is like not a dichotomy, it's, but it's an artificial one. And on the other side, so Privacy International uh, also work with a network, an international network of organization um, all over the world. So it's a, it's a challenge, but it's also extremely uh, important and interesting for us to uh, work with this organization that are either digital rights organization or um, long time civil liberties and human rights organization that are also working on that. I think the structural and cultural challenges are around um, not just what privacy means in, the, uh, in how we are representing, of course, as you said, it has cultural meanings, but also in the, in the consequences that, that it has. Uh, Lina said, like a, a sentence before, talking about people caught in the system. Uh, and a lot of that, uh, when it comes to privacy, to surveillance, it's how people are caught in the system, uh, more vulnerable people, but also everyone, potentially. Mm -hmm. How um, the advancement of technologies, how companies are using technologies, uh, how this can result in discrimination in, um, and even discrimination that we don't see. Uh, and I know that it's also work that Data and Society carries out in the research work, how algorithms are uh, discriminating when it comes to justice, um, when it comes to like buying a house. Um, and sometimes we don't even see it. I have uh, colleagues that work around targeted advertising, um, so I think that, and, and also in a way, because it's so pervasive that for younger people, it's, it's normal, like using social media, for instance, uh, it's normal. And I think that not always people realize, uh, especially, and again, talking about consent, uh, how much of that is a condition, like using technologies in some part of the world uh, is a condition to access benefits to access like basic things so you don't necessarily have a choice you like consent is blurry at best but sometimes it's just that you don't have alternatives so I think that one of the challenges is like how this like structure of, of power um, is uh, is made visible uh, how power players are made accountable mm -hmm. uh, and also how our daily experience of technology uh, is shaping our life experience, but also it's something, and it's a stark difference from before, that it's perpetual in a way, because we now it's part of our lives, and as young people like uh, experience society, it's something that they experience from very early on. Uh, so the fact that a lot of things about us are online and in the, and in the public domain, potentially, um, it's something that, I mean, maybe older people realize because there was a time where it wasn't like that, but mm -hmm. how this perpetual condition becomes somehow like so entrenched in our experience and how much of that we can like understand, experience and fight back right. if we feel that we don't like the way it is. Yeah. Speaking of entrenched and perpetual conditions, I do want to get to disinformation and noise, um, but really quickly, in order to go there, I wanted to pull out a link between your work, Antonella, and Lena's work, because what's interesting about these two experts is that they work in sometimes different cultural or geographic contexts, but from different directions, they both advocate strongly for the rights of refugees and undocumented migrants. And this, of course, as you're alluding to or pointing to, often intersects with discussions in my field around 
the sort of risks and abuses of technology and the power of persuasive media, going back to Anne, how you were talking about the consumption cycle of these stories, and often the stories of very vulnerable people in society. I wonder if the two of you, or maybe three of you, could share some you know, color and feeling about the current political environment for your work. I feel like it would be weird not to ask about that. And on a proactive note, if you want to share any tools or guides that you've been working on um, in your work to help us understand more the stakes of the work you're doing. Uh, so my um, experience of work around migration actually comes from my, my previous job. So I was, before joining Privacy International, uh, working for the Italian National Civil Liberties Organization uh, for, for the past four years. Um, and the, a lot of our work revolved around migration, as it's, uh, it's been a, a crucial issue of, of these years. Uh, and the challenge for us, and again, like going back to how do you talk to, to people, uh, uh, like, Keeping this issue, you like numbers are really important to understand the the scope of the phenomenon because, of course, there were also like a lot of talks of like invasion, uh, uh, emergency, like giving this, this this sense of of pressure. So it's important to have the numbers to put in perspective what we're talking about, uh, but also to, to, to keep it human. So uh, work that that we've done in in that sense um, was uh, actually finding a way to connect advocacy to journalism. We felt uh, at the time, like with, uh, with my organization at the time, that there wasn't enough um, uh, uh, tools, but also there wasn't enough like narrative around this. So it was either the disaster narrative of, look, these people are suffering, uh, or like the, the numbers, like the fight of, of numbers. So uh, we created our own website, uh, still working uh, now, it's called Open Migration, to, and it's both in Italian and English, where we tried to bring together journalism um, in terms of understanding what was happening, uh, but also tools, um, glossaries, uh, quizzes to challenge the, the assumption that you have, uh, fact-checking work, uh, op-eds from, from other people, like a weekly like, review of relevant like, work. And we realized with very few resources um, that there was a demand for that. Even in a context where we were really small and there was a whole media system, those resources uh, kept being uh, used and referenced uh, and be became a source in, in itself. Uh, and this was, I mean, something that we, we didn't expect, but it says something uh, uh, how maybe like we, we didn't have a lot of pressure that journalism had in terms of like money, in terms of advertising, because we had like other funding and another objective actually. Uh, but I think it was a, um, a very interesting experience of how in advocating, uh, there is a lot of space also to uh, provide facts, not as in like cold facts, but giving like a perspective on the experience of people on the root causes. And this is something that was somehow complemented by work that we've done with other organizations, um, the Social Change Initiative and uh, More in Common uh, on understanding audiences. Because I think this is something that it sort of gets lost in the uh, media debate that is heavily polarized. It's either like pro or against and a lot of nuance got completely like lost in the flow and there are actually a lot of people that might not be like not as informed as we are like as activists and advocates uh, that really need like instead to have information but they're constantly facing either like uh, a fear like pressure from, from a part, but on the other side, maybe they're also shut down by advocates in that uh, if you're having a doubt, okay, if you're having a question, maybe you're on the other side. So uh, fueling the, the, the polarizing mm. thing. So, it, so this was part of it. And one of the interesting thing, and this is also something that we've been doing with Privacy International is building tools that then other people can use. It's not just about us and as an organization, but also how we can empower 
uh, other people and other activists. One of the campaigns that we're running at the moment in the UK and hopefully will, like other organizations will, will use is around technologies that are used by, by the police to surveil people. Uh, so we created a series of explainer and gifts, uh, but it's, and, and more resources will be released, but it's for the activists because this, is, this works at the local level. So it wouldn't make sense for us at the national level to tell a person in a community what he or she like, should care about. But maybe these tools can be of support for activists to do their own thing and maybe we can work together if they want, but mm -hmm. it really feels like that community, that context is really relevant and right. coming from outside like, doesn't really like, help if, mm -hmm. you don't, like, if you don't listen, if you don't understand what, what's the need there. Right. So um, I want to pick up on the question of nuance because I think nuance is when we're talking about complexity and we're talking about complexity and understanding the complexity of a system or of a person's life, um, we have to concentrate on nuance. And I, kind of, I sometimes feel like as a storyteller or as a person who uses story as its own tool, that my job is to ensure that there's nuance within a project or a campaign or an organization. And I've been working in the migration and refugee context for about 11 years now, since like 2008. Um, and it was bad when I started. Uh, it's worse. I mean, it is, it is horrific, the level of xenophobia that I see. And I work primarily in the, the sort of U.S., Mexico, U.S., that, that corridor, but I do a lot of work also in terms of looking at what happened with the Syrian context and African context look, going up to, to Europe. Um, and it's, the rhetoric has never been worse. And so part of the job that I feel that I have has gone from using story as advocacy um, to story as just pushing back against toxic narrative. So I'm using, it's not a counter narrative necessarily, but it's really sort of saying, you know, these people are human beings just like you are. And it's become almost a very simplistic strategy um, to try to bring more nuance back into the conversation. And it's really dismaying. Mm -hmm. I've lost friends. I almost like at the height of the, un we had an unaccompanied minors crisis in the United States. I had to take a sabbatical just from like the secondary trauma of working with children. And now we're caging them in the United States, right? We're putting them to cages. So it's gotten worse, but I feel like as it's gotten worse, the questions of how we counter this have become slightly simpler. Like there's, you, you just have to, you have to pick your side to a certain extent. It's gotten really kind of black and white in terms of how we work on it. But in terms of the complexity and the nuance, we can't lose that. And so that's why I keep using um, story. And I'm talking more less to decision makers and more to general public, mm -hmm. which is a new strategy as well. So we just, um, we released, so everything that I'm going to talk about is free and open to the public and you can all use it. So we released a tool um, called Welcome All. Um, it's, a, it's a campaign and we did the Welcome All toolkit. And it's really how you build welcoming culture in your own neighborhood or your own city or your own whatever. It's how do you welcome migrants? How do you welcome refugees? Um, it's a very simple toolkit. It's like, and it's, it's, it's got things like what movies to watch and what dialogue to have and how do you talk to your city government, you know, things like that. So we did that. Um, and then we also, on the other side, on the educational side and the research side, we released a white paper last year about media interventions and their efficacy and the ethics of media for the Syrian refugee crisis. And what we found, it's a 70-page it's a um, white paper, so TLDR, it's really about making sure that we invest in refugee-led um, storytelling, refugee-led journalism, filmmaking, blogging, what do we call blogging anymore? Um, tweeting, whatever, social media. Like It has to be refugee and migrant-led for it to be um, effective. That doesn't accept out, quote-unquote, Western or non-refugee storytellers. You can be in partnership, mm -hmm. but it has to start from there. And so it's a um, it's on my website. You can just download the report, and there's a one-page abstract, too, so you can, you can get that, too. Right. I want to, first of all, thank you for, for naming and stating the circumstances under which you work. Um, I really appreciate that in this public forum. I think there's something to pull on there from 
nuance because um, Data and Society is not an advocacy organization, but we work in technology. And what I've found working with, I'm not a social scientist, but I work with social scientists every day who are studying the effects of emerging technology. And I also work a lot with documentary media teams and newsrooms um, talking about how to frame these massive societal shifts, whether it's rhetorically, whether we're talking about whether we're talking about a way of saying something or a buzzword that has a lot of knock-on effects for how these changes are perceived and who feels invited to the table to be an expert and to talk about them. Some easy, quick fixes, you know, we talk about ourselves as looking at data-centric technologies and automation, not just data-driven, right? We want to reinforce the human agency. And it doesn't always have to be, I have a 75-page white paper, how on earth do I write this executive summary, speaking from experience. Um, but it can be something more simple as a, a conscious pursuit of nuance, accuracy, and clarity. My colleague uh, Madeline Ellis writes about AI technologies um, in multiple sectors, and she talks about integrating these technologies rather than deploying them, because not only does it sound like a fun space age sci-fi trope, but there are humans involved in self-checkout systems. There are humans involved at, at migration points and borders, you know, in tracking mechanisms that affect um, human lives. So just something I wanted to, to pull out there. So here's the pivot to the dark side. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously the last few years have really de-situated experts and devalued fact-based expertise. Um, and it can be really hard to communicate and to get across an environment that is characterized by hostility or fear or mistrust. Um, we do some work on media manipulation, working with um, a stru uh, structural weaknesses, basically, that cause the media sector to be more vulnerable to types of manipulation, so not blaming one group or the other, not blaming journalists themselves, but saying maybe the fact that you don't have a pension and have no rights in your workplace, maybe that has knock-on effects for how vulnerable you are to micro moments, as Joan Donovan says, in breaking news and for picking up, accidentally picking up misinformation or, or disinformation. So. I really want to bring a, a more empathic question to this knowledge-based panel, which is, you know, maybe starting with Anne, how do you feel about your working conditions um, amid all this noise and confusion, and what are the sort of, what's the day in the life of your work that people in the audience wouldn't know? Well, it's hard to define like a typical day because I'm a freelancer, I travel a lot, so that like I could be home office one week and the next one traveling every day. So that's the typical <laughs> part about it. But um, what's definitely become more and more um, part of it and also really frustrating to say the least is that since I'm, or my work is very much focused around gender-based violence, uh, um, and uh, this kind of topic has, well, for a couple of years now, um, I mean, it's not, not, it's not nothing new, but definitely the last couple of years, especially in the German-speaking sphere, uh, it has been used by the right wing uh, to take this issue of violence against women and use it as a means to, uh, yeah, to just spurt their racism, of course. And uh, where you already see this kind of racism can't even work without sexism because, of course, the women that they're concerned about are just seen as properties. They're just white women, you know? So um, it's definitely um, part, more part of my work to, uh, to make that visible, to educate people around that. And uh, that's definitely something um, where, I can, where I see that it's also harder because you realize that 
um, some of the very horrific cases of violence where the perpetrators were migrant men or men of color um, are being much more portray portrayed visibly, spread widely than like the regular or daily, uh, daily uh, violence that happens in this country perpetrated by white men. So you have like, uh, there's like a really um, kind of blurred uh, reality happening there and it's really uh, becoming harder and harder to, uh, to make people aware of the actual reality that's happening. But I think that's why it's important to actually um, yeah, make people aware of, uh, of the stories and experiences that any kind of woman or gender non-conforming and non-binary person in this country that, that's happening with violence is being made visible, you know? So um, that's definitely the, the complexity that I have to deal with and that I have to focus on, but the challenge here is not to just push back against the right-wing uh, uh, yeah, agenda, basically, but also to uh, remind ourselves as feminist activists of our own agenda <laughs> every day, because otherwise it's just, you know, it's just as time consuming uh, because you're not focusing on your own work anymore. And I think it's very dangerous to fall into a trap. So uh, I think you, one of the huge challenges today is uh, to find a balance between that. You know, I always say that probably filtering out the bullshit is basically the most important skill <laughs> right now. So you always have to figure out, okay, what's actually the stuff that I need to focus on that I should address and what's the stuff that I have to let slide, you know? Uh, I mean, otherwise you'll just be overwhelmed and you'll not be able to focus on your actual work anymore. Mm. And that is uh, part of what I think uh, needs to be honed and needs to be defined also, when we think about leadership, be it, uh, may it be in movements or uh, in other uh, fields of work. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else have a reflection? I mean, it's a great reminder that intersectionality is a part of complexity and vice versa. And so it's, it's a huge motif in, in our work. Yeah, sure. I mean, I already talked about sort of the the emotional aspects of the work that we do as, mm -hmm. as activists. and. Yeah. Uh, and there is, what I love about being part of an activist or advocate community is there is so much solidarity, but sometimes we do have to hold each other and ourselves to account, right? So we are sometimes spreading just this, it's, it's, storytelling can turn into propaganda so fast, it's like there's a hair, right, between them. So we can sometimes be guilty of that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we can be guilty of, and this might be a purely American phenomenon, so if that's the case, I apologize for bringing it up, but we are so dependent on celebrities, right, to try to cut through noise. So a lot of what's happening in the sort of the social justice um, Twitterverse or social media verse in the United States is like, everyone's like, oh, can you get us Beyonce? You know, it's like, can you get us a celebrity? Um, which is, you know, it's really annoying. It's one way to cut <laughs> it's through It's one noise. way to cut through the noise. And sometimes mm -hmm. it is the right way to cut through no I'm not, you know, sort of saying, you know, when, when, when someone like Ben Stiller like sits down in front of the Senate and says, you're not paying attention to Syrian refugees, it makes a splash and people start paying attention again. So in terms of like attention, trying to get attention, cutting through the noise that way, but it's certainly not cultivating complexity. And so there's this really interesting, um, and I, I've worked sort of with Hollywood properties, I've worked with large-scale documentaries, I've worked with celebrities, um, and it's not always bad, but it can be very, very reductive. Mm -hmm. and it, can be, it can fall into propaganda or poverty porn really fast, and so we always have to be, we have to hold ourselves to account to make sure that we're not, you know, that we are being fully representational and intersectional in the way we tell our stories. Absolutely. And I think even, that those are great points, I think even empirical evidence itself can be pigeonholed or painted as biased. And so we can talk about that in a bit. But um, any other reflections on that, Antonella? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, all of this experience resonate with, I mean, both my experience my, in my previous uh, um, work capacity, uh, we were, uh, as an organization and as a network of organization, um, under attack by, by like the whole disinformation campaign against NGOs 
that were saving people in the Mediterranean and by extension to all NGOs that were advocating for, um, for migrants and refugee rights. Uh, so, and, and this was because the issues was constantly in the news and constantly main issue in the political debate, uh, the challenge was that it was a, it was a constant, like continuous, uh, like line of attacks uh, of uh, misinformation, of disinformation, of lies, or like outright attacks of your motives. Uh, I think that the the context where I am now, it's a bit different in 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 like in this in how the the work is conducted. But I think there is a, like another risk from the other side of seeing, as you started seeing. Um, the connection and the work is potentially like never ending and you're facing like gi giant companies that are working with humanitarian organization uh, and you're like, okay, this company is, is also doing a lot of, um, uh, like it's being instrumental for governments to conduct human rights abuse, so why are they working on Humanitarian, the humanitarian context. So uh, sometimes there, there might be the feeling that it's, it's too much, it's too overwhelming. And how do you tackle that? How do you work with others? Um, how do you uh, get uh, experiences embedded in the work you do, or even sometimes just uh, pivoting to, to, to others. So yeah. this is work that my, colleague have, my colleagues have done in um, like privacy with a gender lens, for instance, uh, which is something that we, we tend to, f to forget sometimes when we talk about pride, that it's not the same experience. Even abuse and, uh, and challenges are, are not the same for, for everyone. So mm -hmm. I think there, is this, there are two, these two sides. Like the one is like feeling constantly like overwhelm another attack because of like an everyday small series and on the other side of seeing like the bigger pictures and trying to see, okay, where do I tackle that? How do I talk to people about how do I involve? How do I make people care? Going yeah. back to your first question. Yeah, so I'm, I hope you get a IRL <laughs> version of what this work is like. And I'd love for you to share, come to the mic in the center when we wrap to share your own experiences or frustrations or needs around these issues. Very quick uh, call out before we continue. We're talking a lot about misinformation and disinformation without qualifying which is which. I wanted to share that my former colleague Caroline Jack wrote something called The Lexicon of Lies. It is an explainer and a guidebook because this is coming back to precision of language. We found that just establishing a common lexicon of what we mean by these things puts us a couple of steps ahead rhetorically in the messaging game or the messaging war, right? When we're trying to cut through all this noise to have a very precise way of not only identifying that, but looking back at the, the cultural history Caroline Jack is a media scholar. The cultural history of mass propaganda campaigns and of you know funny folksy tales of misinformation, often in early American culture, to uh, to situate ourselves and to to be starting a little further down to again minimize that exhaustion and that drain from trying to constantly fight to establish you know a common way of understanding with each other. So Lena. You've recently grown to focus on leadership, which I thought was really interesting in a conversation that's circling around expertise and on cultivating leadership. So what does this uh, concept of transformational change leadership mean? And for the educators in the room, you know, how can educators act as leaders in this type of environment? Sure. Um, so we released yet another free resource <laughs> um, called Transformational Change Leadership, and I'll tweet that out, which is an understanding of what kind of leadership, what kind of leadership qualities and characteristics does it take to catalyze transformation in your own community, in your own society. And we looked at a, a different, a sort of seven set of characteristics that just kept showing up. We looked across the board. I worked with the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex in, in England, and we looked at a set of characteristics that just kept showing up again and again in different regions, different contexts, from human rights to climate change to education policies, all these different things. And there was a, a set that just kept showing up 
um, vision, there, there are some of them, but vision and empathy are two that often get really defined in very bizarre ways, especially by Silicon Valley and especially by the tech sector. And so we kind of redefined what empathy means, um, what both vision and empathy mean. And specifically for empathy, it means lived experience, right? So we, we grounded that concept and the entire framework in the concept of lived experience, which means that if you are coming from the local community, quote unquote, or the affected community, if you're a refugee, if you're a, a victim of gender-based violence, if you are oppressed by the state, if if you have that lived experience, you are an expert in your own, con like in the condition that has been imposed on you. You are the expert in that case. But there's also the sense of like, if you are living, if you, if you have lived experience, if you know the community really well, if you've connected to them, you can be a Western quote unquote expert. You can be an academic. You can be, as long as you're not sitting in the ivory tower, like if, if as long as you're exposed over time and you're perseverant about being with the community, you also have lived experience. And expertise, right, leadership and expertise are very closely linked, right? Mm -hmm. To be a true leader, you don't have to be the head of something, but you have to know what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And you not, need to know when to follow, mm -hmm. you need to know when to direct, you need to know when to listen. Um, and I think for people who are educators or researchers, um, we don't often attribute leadership qualities to that sector, but that's where leadership is growing, right? I mean, if you know, if you know how to contextualize, I keep coming back to that word, context is so important, but if you know how to contextualize, if you know how to collaborate, if you know how to tell and communicate those stories, you can pass on those lessons. That's what you're doing as researchers and educators. So it's really, really crucial that we look at researchers and um, educators who have lived experience as leaders in the sector as well. Yeah. So I want to leave time for Q&A. Um, so I think I'm going to ask just very quickly um, a wrap up, playing on the idea of where we situate expertise. We were introduced as an all-female panel, as an all-woman identified panel. I want to ask, maybe starting with Anne, where would you subvert ideas of expertise um, and where would you resituate them <laughs> as a communicator? Well. Um, again, speaking about the topic that's uh, closest to my heart and that I deal with basically every day, um, gender-based violence, violence against women, I, real, I always see that um, there is still this dichotomy um, that you're not allowed to be an expert and a victim or slash survivor of violence at the same time. It's not possible because if you're seen as a victim, uh, you're not taken as seriously with your expertise that you're portraying and if you have expertise you need to stay as neutral very high quotations marks uh, as possible because that you know um, and that's something I definitely see even more so uh, in Germany. I think that's still a very German thing to do, not, not exclusively, but I think it's still very much deeply rooted here, um, that you can only be either or. And I think it's really important, again, to allow the complexity of, of people, of human experience, and to, uh, yeah, to uh, redefine, in this case, our societal images of what a victim looks like um, and actually allowing the complexity of these uh, experiences. And I think by allowing people to be experts of their own situations and of the certain topic that they're talking about, uh, but also people who experienced a, a certain kind of violence at the same time, um, would actually open up a more broader discussion about how power structures are at play, how this violence in this case plays out, and how uh, we as a society can actually tackle it and do something against it, because that eventually should still uh, be everyone's goal. I think that's a, a great note to, to pivot on. Um, I'd love to kick it out to the Q&A. Um, if there's anyone out there in the audience who would like to ask the panel a question, there is a microphone stand in the center. Do not be shy. 
or be shy. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I'm, thank you, first of all. Um, interesting listening. I wonder how important you think trust is on the things, stories you tell and yeah, what experience you have and maybe have a tip or two to how, how to build trust, especially if it's more trust in the topic or the person or the organization you're working for. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I'm going to pass that one to Lena first. Sure. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the question. Um, so there's two ways to build trust, I think. Um, one is by what I said before, which was the question of lived experience, like making sure that you are in community with people, making sure that you are always in dialogue, that there is a person-to-person -person connection. Right? I think that's really crucial. And when in the work that I do as an advocate slash storyteller slash technologist, it's very important for me to always know who I'm talking to um, and be in dialogue with them over a long time. Most of the projects that I do take years, and often that's because I'm building relationships. Um, that part is never funded, but that's okay. It's really, really important. The second way to do is when you, when you don't have the opportunity is the question of reputation and credibility. And that's where the question of expertise comes in, right? So again, so I'll just answer this question with a little, a quick story. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started this work 15, 17 years ago, I was the executive director um, of this organization that was working with, um, it, it was around the movie Born to Brothels, which is about children who are raised um, in the red light district, one of the red light districts in Calcutta. And we were doing a tour of this movie, and I was put on a panel as the executive director of the organization with two other quote unquote experts, and then a woman who has, had been a former sex worker and then had sort of left the profession and was helping women leave the profession if they wanted to and, and find other professions. And she um, was not quote unquote educated in the same way we were, but she blew all of us out of the water. Like, because she knew what she was talking about. We were talking from top down. I was like, I was very young at this point. I probably shouldn't have been on that panel, but they put me on it anyway. But it was really incredible. Like, the, that was my first lesson in how she had, one, built community with the women that she was working with, two, was able to communicate that and create an instant bond of credibility, expertise, and trust with the audience because she knew what she was talking about. And I think that was, she had, all of a sudden, she had the most credibility on the panel of all of us. And so I think that there's two ways to go about cultivating trust, right? It is to be in community and second, to communicate credibility. I have a slightly different take on that. Um, in the research and education sphere. So I'm working with academics, um, you know, ethnographers, sociologists, anthropologists, lawyers, sometimes artists, technologists, wonderful, wonderful brainiacs, and their academic credentials often provide a veneer of respectability and trust, but what we've found is that um, beyond credentialism, right, we are now bridging our work to different sectors that are highly involved in designing and integrating new technologies. And what that means is that there's a different idiom for each field, um, and there's a different idiom that will resonate with a different type of stakeholder, whether we're talking about the technology industry situated in Silicon Valley or we're talking about you know, a mid-level standards editor at a newsroom in a major city or at a local paper. And so what we've had to learn to establish trust is to be very careful about tone, to be very sensitive and to perform deep listening with those audiences in order to, even on an expert-to-expert -expert basis, establish a common understanding and be able to scope research products that don't just talk down or talk at other people. That if you're working in an environment, you're a policymaker, maybe you have three minutes, 30 seconds to glance at an email with a PDF attached to it, that's how we should be performing that outreach, not expecting you to read, sorry TLDR, but not expecting you to read 
the massive Moby Dick novel of a report, um, even if we have beautiful and shiny statistics and graphics, which also help, and I love working with illustrators, but it, I really find it's about helping people understand that you understand the pressures they're under, just as we've shared here today, the pressures that we're under in conveying knowledge and information from our side. And if I may add something on, like all these things that have been said, which I share entirely. Also, uh, which is probably the next logic step, logical step, is how you collaborate with others. Uh, working on protecting targeted communities. Uh, sometimes we bring the technical expertise, but we cannot like pretend of knowing like the experience, as, as Lina was saying. So sometimes it's working with these people, sometimes is embedding their experience, of course, depending on, on the context of the research. Uh, uh, recent research that uh, we've done, um, I've done with the, with the Data and Society on digital identity of refugees, um, it was a, a, a case in Italy, and we mostly interviewed people that were, in some cases, in informal settlements. So, there wasn't a way that didn't put them at risk to have them, for instance, on stage when we presented the research or having writing. So it was a very peculiar condition, but we work with the organization that are helping them. We try to work with them as much as possible given the context. And I think that makes a difference uh, in terms of when the research is published, the results, how can they be used, how what is useful for the communities, what is useful for the people, what is useful for the NGOs on the ground. So how you choose to collaborate, giving what you can do and giving what others can do and what are their needs. Thank you. Can I just build on that for one second? Mm -hmm. Because um, I love what you just said and I think that there is, um, we haven't used the word ethics yet, I don't think, and I think that there is a sense of when you're trying to build trust um, around a project around a research paper around a campaign whatever it is mm -hmm. is that we have to be any one of us who's doing this work whether we're researchers educators advocates um, communicators we are mediating somebody else's experience unless you're the first person storyteller unless you are the person who is the survivor of the system that you're caught in um, you're mediating somebody else's experience and you have to have a certain duty of care you brought this up first the duty of care is so crucial to establish and cultivate trust um, and to bring people into like you have, that's the basis of creating community so I just wanted to point that both of these wonderful ladies talked about it already well that is a, a great note to end on this is how you find us. After this panel, we'll be doing a thread of resources and also shout outs we didn't mention to some of our favorite projects, toolkits, and products that you can use for inspiration in your own work. I'd like to thank Republica and the Republica audience and our panelists today so much. <laughs> Yeah.